Hello Internet, this is Oscar Willis again. This time we'll be going over the durand kerner method for solving polynomials. We'll discuss the history and methodology and go through some examples before finally discussing the order. Before diving in, I recommend that you watch my video on Horner's method as well as my video on fixed point iteration for systems of equations. In 1966, Kerner wrote this paper in which he describes a methodology for finding all of the roots of a polynomial simultaneously. Six years earlier, Durand wrote this book, which has a chapter detailing something similar. And in 1963, Dukhieff published this paper, which has this English translation detailing a very similar approach to the other two. All of these people that were rediscovering a method by Weistrauss, which had been published much earlier. These are the exact citations, if you're curious. And in doing background research for this video, I came across these additional sources that detail some of this history and behavior of the durand kerner method. Diving into the methodology now, durand kerner is useful for solving polynomials, such as this one, which we can write more generally. Given a polynomial, we can rewrite it in terms of its roots, where we know our coefficients, such as a, b, c, and d, but we don't know the roots, such as r, s, and t. Given this expression, we can try to solve it using fixed point iteration. Let's try to solve this polynomial. And again, we do know the coefficients. Let's rewrite it so that p is on the right side. Let's divide two of those unknown terms, giving us this form. Afterwards, we can move x to the right side and divide everything by minus 1. We can do the same for s and t. Then, with fixed point iteration, we label the left hand side with sub n plus 1 and the right hand side with sub n. Now we have these three equations, and each of these x terms is independent from each other in each of the equations, so we can just let x be a close guess to the solution, such as this. But what already is a close guess was the previous version of the iteration. So, we'll replace those terms with the previous values for r, s, and t. Then, the real trouble is how do you pick a starting point? But first, let's go over an example. Let's use durand kerner to solve this polynomial and pick three starting values for r, s, and t, such as 0, 1, and 2. Then, do one iteration of durand kerner with these new values, we can do another iteration, and then repeat the process. Now we've converged on values for r, s, and t. Let's look at the polynomial x cubed minus 1. We could start at the value of 1 to find this solution, but what about the other solutions? Where would we even start to find those? When all of our roots are real, we can start with real numbers, but wrong corner usually starts with complex numbers, which could be random, but it's actually better to evenly distribute them. More on this later. Let's look at how we might solve for complex roots normally. For our polynomial of x cubed minus 1, we can rewrite it to be this form. For the term on the right, we can solve it using the quadratic equation, giving us this expression, which simplifies to these three terms, and therefore we know all three of our roots where i is the square root of minus 1. Visually, in the complex plane, each of these three points would give us a value of 0 when plugged into z cubed minus 1. For example, if we took the actual value of 0 plugged into the expression, would give us minus 1. Negative 1 would give us minus 2, 2 would give us 7, and any other point would be evaluated the same way. It might be more helpful to visualize it in terms of size, but Plotting a lot of points this way would still be difficult. Therefore, it's actually nicer if we use color. Here, the darkest parts are the solutions to our polynomial. Going back to our example from earlier, let's change the graph to be our colored heat map. Let's try to evenly space out our points along the circle covering our graph. But how big do we make this circle? We can use this equation given by Ehrlich, where for our function of x cubed minus 1, we're going to then take the cubic root of negative 1 over 1 in absolute value, giving us a radius of 1. Now we can apply durand kerner And indeed, these solutions match the ones that we found earlier. 
Regarding notation, we've been using this form, but more generally, we can write it using this expression. The difference between Duran Kerner and Newton Horner is that Newton Horner finds one root at a time, then deflates it and restarts the process, where with Duran Kerner, we're finding all roots simultaneously. Now you might be saying, but we're solving multiple equations. To that I say we can parallelize things because this is an embarrassingly parallel problem, as Cleve Mahler might say. We start the problem of picking starting points, which I sort of breezed over. The best policy is to evenly distribute n points along a circle, using this expression for r given by Ehrlich. You can slice up the circle in 2 pi over n or 360 over n if you prefer degrees. You'll also want to avoid conjugate pairs and the real number line. So a birth recommends adding an offset to theta such as pi over 2n. Then what you're left with is this equation for each starting point. Or you can use Euler's formula to simplify it to this. We still have to worry about when to stop though, and our usual criteria for fixed point iteration will still apply. But you can also stop as you find roots. Let's look at this polynomial, which is z to the eighth plus 15z to the fourth minus 16. Using our equation from Ehrlich, we can figure out how large to make our circle. In this case, we'll take the eighth root of negative 16 over 1 in absolute value. This means our radius is of size square root of 2. So let's draw that circle. Then evenly distribute our points. And don't forget about the offset. Now we can apply Duran Kerner. After eight iterations, we're able to find all of our roots. A birth makes a few keen observations about the behavior of Duran Kerner, noting typically the successive approximations moved in the direction of a nearby zero, and that often two points approach the same simple zero, with one moving off on later cycles towards a free zero. And lastly, a multiple zero eventually attracted as many distinct points as its multiplicity. The points tended to assume symmetrical positions around the zero, advancing slowly toward it. These comments are made about both Duran Kerner and a birth Ehrlich. The order of Duran Kerner is quadratic, but it can be linear when multiplicity is involved. There are other factors that impact its performance, such as the spacing of the roots, your initial starting values, and just the condition of the polynomial in general. For more reading, I would suggest this paper on safe convergence of simultaneous methods for polynomial zeros. What I want you to take away from this video is that Duran Kerner is useful for finding both real and complex roots of polynomials and usually starts with complex numbers evenly distributed along a circle. It has quadratic convergence behavior and converges safely in general. It's also easy to parallelize. For further watching, I recommend seeing my video on a birth Ehrlich and the code that I used to create the images as well as to solve polynomials will be hosted on GitHub. And that's all for this video on Duran Kerner. If you enjoyed this presentation, I encourage you to watch the other videos on this channel and to suggest topics for future videos that you'd like to see me make. Thank you.